You are gonna learn some clever shenanigans to outwit, outfox, and outthink your opponent in 40k. With this video, you will absolutely be able to outmarmoset your opponent, and both of you should have fun when this happens. This is Mind Games on the Tabletop. The psychological aspects of 40k games, including bluffing, misdirection, and managing stress during the high stake games. And if I may start with some aggressive positivity, you will succeed. It is inevitable. This is not Gaslight, Gatekeep, Gene Stealer Cult, so I'm not going to suggest things like dropping a dice on the floor so we can go under the table and tie our opponent's shoelaces together. Let me know if you have any specific footwear you put on for 40k games. I'm not going to do a follow-up video on that, I just think your comments are funny. We're going to start with some quick suggestions and then get into the more detailed stuff. So have patience. That's a quick one. For Gene Stealer Cult, having a unit waiting in reserves until turn 3, assuming you can spare it, leaves your opponent wondering where they're going to turn up, where they're going to strike. And because our stratagems, like Tunnel Crawlers, are once per phase, it means in turn 2, you can have a unit arrive by Tunnel Crawlers, and then in turn 3, do the same thing again. If you have two Acolyte units, and both of them have demo charges, and you want to throw those demo charges as you arrive, this is what you should be doing. This will allow you to do that, by having patience. Along those lines, we also need to stay calm. Stay emotionally a little bit distant from the game. That is what I have to do in competitive games, so I don't just rush in shouting for the Emperor, or for the Patriarch, depending on how much I want to confuse my opponent. Relax. Be calm. To stay calm during the matches, you could stroke your favorite little familiar model. That'll keep you grounded. Now let's think of the element of surprise. Surprise. No one is going to be exp Surprise. No one is going to be expecting Gene Stealer Cult. That happens in the law, and it happens on the tabletop. Even when Gene Stealer Cult was one of the highest performing factions near the start of the edition, people were still expecting Eldari to turn up. Not the Gene Stealer Cult. There are not that many Gene Stealer Cult players, so if you play Gene Stealer Cult, the odds are you are the only one that plays Gene Stealer Cult at your local club. So as soon as that army comes out, it's a whole new game for the enemy. Opponents are not used to Gene Stealer Cult or the way they play. If they played against Chaos Demons, yeah, it's a bit like Demons for deep striking later in the game and being everywhere and oh no, look, it's your dad. As great a Demons turn up. But your opponent needs to switch mindset very quickly. They are no longer in a straight up fight against an enemy like Imperial Guard or Space Marines. But even if your opponent is used to different tactics and they're used to hordes of Chaos Cultists or Orcs running at them, they're going to have a difficult time with Gene Stealer Cult anyway. We play very differently. They're now fighting an insurgency, and we need to think about that too. And even though we're fragile like those Chaos Cultists, with all of the shenanigans available and deep striking, we're able to punch far above our weight. And those tactics can begin at deployment. Deploy a lot of units on the board. You will then be able to see where the enemy is deploying units. If you put a unit of Acolytes on the far left flank, then your enemy is going to deploy a unit with anti-light infantry weaponry over there to counter them. Perhaps a unit with flamers, like the Infernus Marines. At which point, your Primus can use their ability, and they can use this ability even if they're not on the table, the Decoys and Misdirection ability. So even if you've reached the maximum capacity the main rules allow for units and points in reserve, you can move three units underground. This means you can do a brilliant refused flank. Your opponent's flamer weapons are now far out on the left, and there's now no units opposing them. The acolytes they were going to fight are now in reserves. So you know where the enemy's weaponry is, and you can then deep strike far away from them. So your acolytes will end up safe, and not just running into fire. This ability from the Primus, in smaller games, may mean that you don't have anything on the table in turn 1. That is very much an option. It's a bit more viable in Crusade games, but since in competitive games, primaries are not scored on turn 1, you're not really losing out. Using your own deployment zone is entirely optional. And then we'll make the enemy deployment zone our deployment zone through the use of Deep Strike. Deploying units even when you fully intend to take them off the table also means that we have more deployment drops, so we get to see more of what the enemy is deploying without them knowing as much of what we are actually going to be leaving on the table. So have three units you know you're going to take off the board, deploy them first, 
and in real terms, you now know where three enemy units are going to be deployed, and your opponent is only going to get confused about what ends up staying on the table. And don't think that this refused flank idea is only possible during deployment. You can do it in the middle of the game. If you don't want to fight a massive Necron blob of immortals, or you need your troops elsewhere, you want to leave 20 Death Guard zombies on an objective instead of trying to shoot through them, we can return to the shadows and use that firepower where it is going to have more effect. We control the game. That is how Gene Stealer Cult players have to work. So if your enemy has just committed another unit to try and take an objective from you, and they're gonna take it, you can just remove your units off the board and now the enemy units are far out of position and you have one or two more units that you can use effectively on the other side of the board. If you're losing one objective to then take two more, that's a net gain. Distract the enemy, discombobulate. Cult ambush, discombobulate, return to the shadows, and then repeat. If your opponent ever abandons an objective, for example, if the mission doesn't require you to hold your home objective and it's all about the objectives in no man's land, that's an objective you can claim at any point you want using Return to the Shadows, just at the time you happen to draw the secondary objective to capture enemy outpost. It's brilliant. You're brilliant. The Gene Stealer Cult is brilliant. And there may be times where we can taunt the enemy off an objective. The Nexus Cult Infiltration ability allows you to move an ambush marker. You could move it further away so it's going to be safe, or you could move that ambush marker closer to enemies to make them choose between destroying a unit in inverted commas, the unit's already been destroyed, it's coming back, it's another version of the unit. If they just move a bit closer, they can prevent those 10 aberrants from coming back. And if your opponent has to choose between doing that and taking an objective from 10 neophytes, if they don't go for the cull ambush marker and instead take the objective, you now have a unit that's going to be able to counterattack on that objective. If they go for the marker, oh no, we've been delayed once again in bringing back our 10 aberrants. We'll just have to wait for another cult ambush marker. And all while this is happening, we still hold the objective, the thing that scores us the victory points. So let's have a look at the cult ambush rule. When one of your Gene Steel cult units is destroyed, that has the cult ambush rule, so vehicles like the Ridge Runner don't have this rule, check the data card, it will tell you whether this unit can come back by cult ambush or not. We roll a dice, adding one if it's a battle line unit, and adding another one, these are cumulative, if it is the first or second battle round. On a 5+, plus, you get a brand new unit that looks exactly the same as the one that was just destroyed. And you then get to place a cull ambush marker. If an enemy moves within 9 inches of that marker, the marker is destroyed. But the unit that is remaining in cult ambush is not destroyed. It's just staying in a pool that is cult ambush. So if you had 3 markers on the board for your 10 aberrants, 5 gene stealers and 10 neophytes, and 2 of the markers are removed, it doesn't matter which one you placed after the 10 aberrants were destroyed, your 10 aberrants can return from that final token, the one that remains. And we can be quite clever with this. Your opponent has just destroyed a unit and feels good. You roll a dice. If you act like a games master in a roleplay game and roll a dice but remain positive as nothing happened, then your opponent will get an appropriate feeling of concern. Don't you just hate it in roleplay games where you're talking to someone and then the GM will suddenly roll a dice and note something down but then ask you to just carry on like it's all fine? It's not quite like that, but we mustn't look too down when we don't get a unit back through Cult Ambush. And I've had many games where I got no units back, but when you do get a unit back, cackle that the unit your opponent just destroyed is back for round two, fully re-equipped with demo charges, at full health and ready to go again. There is now a one turn countdown. Tick tock, Dr. Crank and Foof. I don't think you'll be able to get out of this one. Okay, maybe that's less a mind game and more being cartoonishly evil. Do I give off a cartoonishly evil vibe? We are role-playing leading Gene Steel Cult and that is fun. If Orc players get to shout wah and Guard players get to shout their orders to the models, why can't we smile as neophytes are gunned down and then place a new marker whispering, all part of the plan. And it is part of the mindset of having a fun game. If your opponent thinks that they just cannot beat your army, then they won't win. At that point, you can't talk your opponent back and say, well, actually, my army rule isn't that bad for you. If I'm winning, it keeps me winning. If I'm losing, I just stay losing. Because all they will see is GW, 40k, OP, BS, GSC. You understood those acronyms, didn't you? But our army rule is quite weak. A lot of the time, it isn't doing anything. Most of you are not getting your units back. 
And when you do, you're not able to do that much with them. Of all the games I've played since it introduced it only working on a 5 plus in a balance patch, I have had one useful unit back. Maybe two. Some gene stealers took an objective and cleared Gretchen from another objective. It didn't change the game and I still lost. So we have to make use of the models we have and use the army rule more for psychology than for anything in particular in game. Experienced players will see the blip and ignore it if they can score an objective or kill another gene stealer cult unit. And it does feel like wiping out a whole unit of mine just by walking there. But we still miss a turn, and then we are very out of position even if you use the Nexos to bring your marker closer. But the other time I got a useful unit back, it was pure strain gene stealers again. I took the enemy home objective, because even though they're far out of position, they can move 8 inches, they can advance and still charge. So while I was 20 inches away with my marker, I was able to immediately charge on my next turn. That is how you get back in the fight. Take more pure strain gene stealers. So with Cull Ambush, if your gene stealer cult unit has been destroyed, an identical but new unit is going to return to the battlefield. Let's think a little bit more about where to place your Cull Ambush marker. It's tempting to place the marker near to the enemy to prepare to fight back, but if you're too close, then the slight move from the enemy will see your marker removed. Even if the enemy unit you want dead is currently locked in combat, there is a risk of them winning the fight or falling back, and any sort of move removes your blip. I say blip because I use the much older markers from the Space Hulk expansion. If you put your cult ambush marker too far away to be useful, in the Ascension Day detachment, we can return to the shadows at the end of the opponent's turn, allowing the unit to re-arrive from Deep Strike in your turn. That's how you make sure that your units that are out of position get where they should be. And finally, remember that you don't need to fight the enemy. We are an insurgency. So it's easier to get into the mindset that you need for tournament tactics. Things like standing in front of the enemy and move blocking them. Ignoring gunning down a unit and instead scoring the victory points from the secondary objectives. These are the tournament tactics that people use all the time at those events. Playing Gene Stealer Cult will get you into the mindset for these kinds of tactics and they will feel appropriate even in casual games. Even though we come back by Cult Ambush, remember that there is no lose condition if every one of your units is wiped out. Victory is based entirely on points. And now if we can end on some more ominous positivity, you will play better and have more fun games of 40k. That is coming to you. It is too late to stop now. And if you're now interested, this is how to get started with the Gene Stealer Cult. My darlings and viewers, surprise!